Here I've got an easy repair, anyone can do themselves. In this case, it's a 2017 Kia Forte. The check engine light's coming on, it isn't running right. We'll open the hood, but thank goodness the check engine light is on. So rather than guess, we'll use a computer. I hooked it up the car, as you can see, it says PO301, cylinder one misfire detected. Now unfortunately, these PO codes are what are called generic codes. Lots of things can make an engine misfire. Could be the spark plug, could be the ignition coil, could be the wiring, could be the computer. And just don't think it's ignition system. You got a bad fuel injector that can make a car misfire. Gasket, intake gasket, head gasket on number one, that can make it misfire. But the absolute simplest thing to do is this. First, we'll take the stupid beauty cover off, get it out of the way, and here's the ignition coils. One, two, three, four. Now it says number one is misfiring, so we're gonna take that out. You just unscrew it. Sometimes they're hard to get out, so you wiggle them and unplug them. In this case, it's a dual system. They have to make it harder than normal, so you gotta click it up, then squeeze it to get it off. It won't come off if you don't push that up. The number two ignition coil. Get that out, wiggle it, pull it off, get the screwdriver, unlock the tab. There we go. Then we flip it over and squeeze it, <clears throat> off it comes. Then we'll do a simple test. We'll put number two in the number one hole, and number one in the number two hole. We'll put the bolts back in. You gotta make sure they're lined up. They gotta line up with their hole, and get them snug. And remember to plug them in. This one plugs in here, snap. This one plugs in there. We'll leave the top off, it's just a stupid beauty cover. Then we'll just push reset on the scan tool, and that resets it so there's no codes. Then we'll take it for a little drive. Well, I drive around, the light came back on, so that's good. Now we can check it. So we'll plug the working end in again. Here we go. See what it says. Here we go, it's gonna read it. Well, it's got one code, and the code is P0301. Misfire cylinder number one, so it's not the coil because it's still not firing right. Well, guess what? Now we're back to square one, but at least we didn't waste any money. We swapped the coils, but the misfire stayed where it was originally, so it's not the ignition coil. So put the coil back, take the other one off. So we're gonna check the spark plug, and lo and behold, the spark plug is loose. It's not in tight enough. We're gonna check it out anyway. It doesn't look bad, but who knows? Since this one's loose, we're gonna check them all, and I'll probably replace them anyway. Take them all out, see if any of them are loose too. Stick them in the spark plug holes. These are a little loose too. And put it all back together and see what happens. Make sure I put them in the right holes. This is the green one, that's number one. And now we're missing one, there it is, there's number two. And we'll hook all the cables up. One, two, those we didn't unhook, and then we'll bolt them all back in, all four of them. And we'll start her up again, see what happens. Well, it's running good now, so we'll take it for a road test and see what happens. And now I'm back, it's running fine, no check engine light. I did put in four new spark plugs, the old ones had gotten loose, but it's got 80,000 miles, so I put in new spark plugs, no more misfiring. And you might wonder, why did it only have a misfire on one cylinder, and not all of them if the spark plugs were worn out? Well, even though it's a machine, things don't necessarily wear evenly. In this case, the number one spark plug got looser and wore more than the other spark plugs did, but you're gonna change them, change them all. Don't go through the trouble of guessing here and there. Change all four of them, make sure they're nice and snug so they don't get loose again, and it won't have misfires. In this case, just a misfire on one cylinder, not on the others. Eventually, you probably would have done them all, but we want to fix cars, so when you fix them, fix them right. If one's bad, change them all. This Toyota RAV4 just came over here. The check engine light's on, it's got the code P0171, which means the engine is running too lean. Now, unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of things can do that. So, you have to start logically. Go under the hood and look at the most logical things first. Now, running too lean means that the combustion inside the engine is burning at a too lean ratio, meaning either it's not getting enough fuel so it runs lean, or it's getting too much air and it's running too lean. Now one of the common things for that is a vacuum leak. If a hose has come off, if a gasket's 
broken and sucking air into the engine it'll run too lean so that's the first thing you look for and if you're really smart and have just a regular scan tool you can get a $40 one that does this it's got the code that means there's data stored so you go to the section on your computer it's called freeze frame data here it is here view freeze frame data so you look at it you get tons of information there and the main thing when you're running too lean is you want to look at when did it occur it'll show you the speed of the car if the speed of the car is zero and that code tripped when it was idling that generally means it has a vacuum leak because when the car is idling the engine isn't moving that fast so it has a little less vacuum pressure if you get a vacuum leak and you're idling with a low vacuum pressure that'll set it down quite a bit percentage wise can make it run lean then it trips the code realize that the codes are tripped when the computer sees like 20 percent or more off value so it's got to be a reasonable amount this lean code tripped when you're going 65 miles an hour odds are it's not a vacuum leak because it's 60. the engine's spinning like man it's got tons of vacuum pressure it's got a little vacuum leak it's not going to bother it that much because the leak is going to be a smaller percentage of what it is when the engine's only idling a much lower vacuum pressure so if it did occur at lower speeds or at an idle you want to look all around for vacuum leaks and on these toyotas it's often a vacuum line that comes off a lot of times the one back here behind the air filter gets pulled off and somebody changes the air filter but that one's not bad sometimes they come off of the pcv system but that's on nice and solid if you can't see or hear any vacuum leaks when the engine's idling use your ears and if you hear a sucking air look around you can do like i showed in the previous video get a little wd-40 with the spray nozzle spray it around and if you get say on the intake manifold and it starts to change the idle you know it needs an intake manifold gasket but the code tripped on this one when it was going 56 miles an hour so it happened at a higher speed now if you get a running too lean at a higher speed and you look at the trouble code freeze frame data it happened at a higher speed in this case 56 miles an hour odds are it's not a vacuum leak but it's something in the fuel injection system you could have a clogged filter you could have a weak pump you could have a bad mass sensor those are the most common things to check for so the first thing you do would be check the fuel pressure now here's a warning if your fuel filter is easily accessible change the fuel filter first because fuel filters if they clog up guess what after the filter the pressure will go down make it run lean because you don't have enough pressure to spray the fuel injectors correctly so if you do have a fuel filter that's easy to access go ahead and change it now on my old Celica hey it's just two bolts you take off you replace the filter so that's what I would do but on this modern ramp 4 fuel filter is inside the gas tank now you don't have to drop the tank but you got to take the back seat out then you have to take the access panel then you got to pull the fuel pump assembly out because the filter's built in there now toyota generally wants to sell you the whole fuel pump assembly for six seven hundred dollars with the filter built in you can buy a filter but in this case hey you're not going to just change the filter on the lark because it's such a pain in the butt so we're going to just check the fuel pressure it's supposed to be between 44 and 50 pounds per square inch we test it and that's what it is well then we don't have to worry about changing the fuel filter because the pressure's coming out fine anyway since it's such a job to get in there and change the filter we're just going to check the pressure on this so we'll get out my fancy fuel injection tester kit and i do mean fancy because toyota over the ages they've been kind of a swine about checking fuel pressure they never had test valves on them most of them don't anyways modern anyways they all went that way it's cheaper to make it but you got to get a special adapter you hook it on the fuel line and then check it with a gauge you're going to have to buy the special toyota adapter which isn't cheap so you might want to pay somebody else to do this and in this case it's fine it's about 50 51 pounds so we know the fuel pressure is good so it's not that it's not getting enough fuel next thing to check is the mass sensor mass airflow sensor now in these toyotas the notorious are getting dirty and giving false readings so they can make them run lean it's right here simple thing to get to right here there it is now you can only clean these things with mass airflow sensor cleaner don't try anything else gotta leave no residue yeah the stuff costs a lot sometimes these cans are like 10 12 bucks but they last for a long time you don't need that much cleaner to clean them you just remove it from the vehicle it just unplugs 
you gotta squeeze the heck out of it. Then remove the two Phillips screws that hold it in place. They just screw out, and the sensor wiggles and comes out. Now cleaning is pretty easy. There's a little metal piece here, right in here. You want to clean the heck out of that. And there's also one inside. So for that, you spray it in the front, then you spray it on the other side of the hole, and it cleans the stuff on the inside. And here comes the part that everyone hates. Patience. Something hardly anybody has these days. It's a very volatile cleaner. You want to do it outside so you're not breathing in. You want it to completely air dry so there's no residue of vapors on it when you start it up. Because if you clean it, put it right in and start it up, a lot of electricity goes through here. Those vapors can short things out. And even worse, don't clean them on the vehicle. If you take the hoses off and clean it from the inside, then you got all that vapor in there. Don't do that. Take it off and clean it. Most cars, it's not that big of a deal getting it out. And like I say, if you clean it, wait about half an hour. Because I've seen people who didn't, they were in a hurry or cleaned it inside, and then boom, the electricity hit the vapor, burnt things out, then they had to buy expensive sensors. Do it externally, let it air dry, that way you can't hurt anything. Then after half an hour or so, you just put it back in its hole, the same way it came out. Make sure it's seated in, because there's an O-ring in there. Then you put the two screws in. One and two. And of course, don't forget to snap the electrical connection in. There. Then we'll just close the hood. Then erase the code, just push erase. Yes, yes. This now erases the code. So the code's gone and take it for a good road test. Now sometimes codes take a long time to come back, but take it for on the highway, in town, maybe a half hour trip. If the light doesn't come back on, then you just drive it. And after two, three weeks it doesn't come back, you fixed it. In this case, since this is a 2.5 liter engine, when it's idling, the data, the mass airflow, should be somewhere around two and a half grams per second that it's flowing when it's at idle and drive. So I checked it and it was like 2.64, which is perfectly fine for this. If it had been really low, like 1.6, that would mean it's giving it way too little gas. And if the reading had been really high, like 4.7, then it would give it too much gas, but then it would be running rich, not lean. If it's running below the parameters, then it's gonna run lean because it thinks there's less air coming on, so it gives it less fuel. Now in this case, when they get dirty, they often give a false reading. We're hoping that that's what it is. After the half hour drive, it didn't come back on. You really, like I say, give it a couple of weeks because these things can be very slow at picking things up. But if it never comes back, then you know it was just a dirty mass airflow sensor. Now in the case of this Mercury Grand Marquis, the coolant is leaking down the front where the radiator is. So, we'll take this plastic shield out of the way. Then we'll get a flashlight and start looking around. Realize the radiators are made out of aluminum, even they're called plastic radiators because they have plastic ends. And as we look around, we can see there it's leaking. And right there, somebody attempt to fix it using epoxy. But the epoxy didn't work and it's leaking all over the place. From my experience, it's a complete waste of time trying to fix a plastic radiator, and here's why. 21 years old. The plastic gets brittle. If it cracks and you fix a crack, the whole thing's brittle. It's going to crack somewhere else, or the brittle plastic might not even hold the epoxy. So when it's broken like this, just replace it. But it's not as bad as you might think. My customer bought a brand new radiator for it. Now this brand new radiator only cost 119 bucks at a discount auto parts store. They're made out of plastic and aluminum. They're cheap to make. You can buy Chinese ones, no problem, as long as they fit. Like I said, made in China, doesn't matter, as long as it fits. Now changing the radiator isn't that bad. You gotta take all the plastic junk off, bolt it to the radiator first. So we'll take the overflow tank off. There we go, but this is in the way, so we gotta take the mount off too. So we'll remove the radiator mount, happens to be the same size bolt. Off comes the mount, then we get to the little spring. That holds the tank on, and it's kind of a pain, so we'll take the top one off instead. It's easier to get to. So we'll wiggle it some more and see if we can get it off. There, now that's off. If you reach behind where the overflow tank is, you can unbolt the cowling for the fan. One on this side, and one on that side. And while we're at it, we'll kick the drain pan under here and disconnect the upper radiator hose. Now I use a special tool for that. It's a clamp remover. It's a lot easier than using pliers. Pliers often slip these, don't you? You just clamp them, 
so they're real tight, then the clamp will slide off. We can leave it on and then pull the hose off. And off goes the hose. We'll move it out of the way. Then we can take the other bolt off that holds the radiator fan cowling on. Then as you can see, the whole fan assembly moves out of the way. You know it's an old car, it's got an electric fan. So with an electric fan, it's a lot easier. You don't have to unbolt all that fan clutch. You just take this out of the way. Now then we'll remove the other bolt that holds the other side of the radiator on. Kind of old and corroded. It's going to be kind of hard to get off. So push hard and then start it. Now it's going to come off. You don't want to strip it. Take it off, get it out of the way. Now the radiator seems to be sticking on the bottom. So let's get under here and check it out. A couple of bolts down here we got to take off too. And while we're under here, we'll take this hose off, the bottom hose, so we can get it out easy. And once it's loose, we can pull it off. Sometimes they stick on pretty hard. Eventually they'll pull off. Then we'll remove the cooling lines here. Pull them off. You get enough room to pull out the radiator. That's an extra cooler here. Normally they're built into the radiator, but not on this one. So it actually makes this a somewhat easier job. Then out it comes. Fights it every inch. Then you get the new radiator. That goes over there. Because the other one's on the bottom. Slide it in. Got to do a lot of wiggling here. Finally it slides in. Then before I forget, we'll put the mounts on. We want to make sure the mounts line up. On both sides. Then we'll put the cooling hoses back on, and as usual, the one clamp's disappeared, so I have a box ready to put regular clamps on. They work better anyways. Then we'll stick the fan back on. As you can see here, it snaps in place. Then you bolt it on each side. Then we'll put the tank back in place. Bolt it on. Put the hose on. Then put the top radiator hose back on. We'll try the pliers this time. Getting it on is usually easier than getting it off. And it certainly was. Then go back onto the car. You don't want to forget the other hose. You'll have a giant mess. There's the hose. Goes right on there. And we'll put the clamp on. And on it goes. Nice and tight. And then we tighten the bolts on the bottom back up. Then comes the easy part. Fill it up with coolant. In this case, it's the old Ford coolant. We put in 50% coolant and 50% water. And start the vehicle up to warm it up. Half coolant, half water. This is the water hand. Now, unfortunately, as it's warming up, check it out. Bunch of smoke is coming out of the exhaust. As you can see, it has no tags, so I'm guessing that he drove it with a hole in the radiator. Probably blew the head gasket. Only time will tell, but with this much smoke coming out, I'm guessing the head gasket's blown. Then you just pull it up to the top, put the cap back on, take off the prop rod, and pray the head gasket is not blown. Only time will tell on that one. One of the most annoying things is your car's running okay, but you go to get it inspected and it fails the test. When we plug in the old scan tool, and any scan tool will read this, even a $20 one, it shows it's got PO100 mass volume airflow A circuit. And here's how that circuit works. This is a mass airflow sensor. Inside it, little electronic part. It measures how many grams of air flow into the engine per second and then tells the computer how much fuel to send to the fuel injector so the car runs perfectly. So let's open the hood and find it. Here it is, right here. Bolts on here, snaps on here. Now if we look closely, we'll see there's no frayed wiring or anything. Sometimes the wiring gets frayed. Sometimes that's the problem. Sometimes you can even clean them with mass airflow sensor cleaner. You want to use just this because it leaves no residue. But I've been working on these things for years. And I know when it gets that particular coat on a Nissan, it's a problem in the circuit. It's not dirt or anything. It's not running rich or lean. There's a problem in the circuit. And from my experience in these, it's always the sensor itself is just wearing out. Now, if you feel lucky, you can take it out and clean it. I got a whole video on cleaning it. Make your car run better with a little spray cleaner. You can watch that and watch if you feel real lucky. But with this particular coat, there's a problem in the circuit. And from my experience, there's only three things that can do that. A bad sensor, bad water wiring or a bad main computer. Now I've looked at this wiring, I don't see anything frayed and where it frays is always at the end where the sensor is. I see them where they get brittle, where they come apart. I'm gonna unsnap it just to make sure it's not corroded and green though. So we'll squeeze it and pull it off. Ah, and let's look inside. As you can see, it's pretty well sealed with these seals. Everything is shiny and metal. 
there's no corrosion there. When we look inside here, it's kind of dark. It doesn't look bad, but I gotta take it off and inspect it in the sun. So we'll unscrew this. That's just, this is all one piece. We'll just unbolt the air filter box and pull the whole thing off. Out it comes. Now, as you can see in the sunlight, this is crystal clean. Not dirty, no problem with that. We're just gonna replace it. Easy job, just take the bolts off. It's a lot easier doing this once you get it off the car. All kinds of working room here. Even that one's kind of tight, cause that's in the way. Isn't that typical? You take all those off, and normally you gotta measure which way it goes so you don't put it backwards. It's got a little mark around here and it says airflow goes this way. But, in this case, you don't have to worry because one end bolts on, the other's different. So you can't put this one on backwards. A lot of them, both ends are the same and you could put it in backwards, it wouldn't run right. But this, it only bolts on one way, so you don't have to worry with this design. And here you want to use a new one. Rebuilt ones, you never know. This is brand new. It's already got a new gasket. Just bolts on. Get all four bolts on. And make sure they're all tight. Get them nice and snug. You don't want any air leaking past it. Then flip it over and do the other side. It's important that you have an airtight seal because this is all filtered air. You don't want non-filtered air with dirt in. That will ruin these things. These are hot mass airflow sensors. When you shut the car off, it burns any impurities off these wires by getting them glowing red hot. If you get any dirt on that, it'll make it burn itself out. Just like if you touched the filament of a light bulb with your greasy hands, it'd ruin it. So make sure it's nice and tight. Then we put it back on first thing. Slip it over the rubber. Then when that slipped over, put the air box in its place. Make all the snaps click. Realize there's one's up here too, and one you can't even see on the other side. But you'll hear it click when I hit it. There. Then we just tighten up the clamp. Get it nice and tight. You don't want air leaking there especially. And while you're at it, go to the other side. Follow it, make sure everything's solid. Make sure that's all bolted on tight, it is. Okay, then we go back inside, and what we do is, with the scan tool hooked up, we will turn the ignition key on. So the key is on, the idiot lights are on, but the car's not running. Then we go to the car rear and go back, and what we want to do is erase codes. So we'll go to diagnostic codes up here, erase codes, yes. So we click yes, guess we got to click it twice, there. Then we enter, turn key on with engine off, enter, now it's erasing the code. You have to erase it because if you fix it, eventually it will erase itself, but they could take a while and this is instantaneous. You can see now it says there's no codes, but we don't trust anyone, so we'll go back, we'll go back to read codes, and let's see what it says. No codes found, so now it's reset. And now comes the easy boring part. We just start it up. and let it warm up. We've reset it, but cars have what's called a drive cycle. And in order to pass the emissions test, it has to go through the drive cycle. So we're gonna take it on a highway, going 55 miles an hour or faster, then drive it in town a little and see what happens. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to special functions. As we do special functions, it's quite interesting. We want the global OB2, and what we're going to is the drive cycle monitor. And as you can see here, there are one, two, three, four, five incomplete monitors. So I restart the car, and we're going to watch these. Now there's only four. It's already reset one. Most vehicles, it'll pass inspection that it has to have just one monitor incomplete. There's four now. But this is an old car. It's a 98. And back in those days, you're still allowed to have two incomplete. So we just have to drive it until there's only two incompletes then we can get it inspected. And as I said, you gotta drive on the highway a while at 55, 60 miles an hour, so here we go. And wouldn't you know it, I got a road testing going fast. Here I am in a massive traffic jam in Houston. Isn't that just typical? <laughs> just realize that sometimes it takes a while, especially these older cars. Drive it and watch the monitors until it's down to two. Well, now it's getting down there. And hooray, now it's down to two, we can go back. Now, as I said, most modern cars, when they're 2,000 or newer, you can only have one mill not ready to pass the test. But this is a 98, so with two mills not ready, it will pass the test. 
Okay, now there's only two mills not ready. That means this particular 198 will pass the test. But we got to make sure of one thing. We're going to go back. Diagnostic codes. Here we go. And pray it hasn't said any while we were driving. So here goes nothing. Read codes. No codes found. That means it's going to pass the emissions test. And we succeeded. Hurrah. Sometimes it's a pretty easy job if you use your noggin. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.